Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, post-match Novak Djokovic versus Carlos Alcaraz, Madrid 2022 semifinal. If you're not here for spoilers, click off the video in three, two, one. First meeting between Alcaraz and Djokovic goes the way of the young Spaniard. He moves on to the Madrid final and becomes the first man ever to beat Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic back-to-back in the same tournament on clay. He does it in a third set tiebreak. He does it in a match that was epic. That was about three and a half hours. That was thrilling. That was high level, elite level, dare I say. And certainly the best of three set match of the year to date. This was also one of the closest matches that you could possibly imagine. And that makes for kind of an interesting post-match analysis because you can say, well, again, I try to answer the essential question, why did the player who won win? But in a match like this where they quite literally could not separate themselves, and I mean, I'm not just saying that because it was a third set tiebreak. I'm saying the first set was close. I'm saying the second set was close. The third set was close. Almost every game in the third went to deuce. I mean, they just could not find an advantage against each other. It was the ultimate tug of war where nobody was winning. Uh, and, you know, it comes down to obviously a couple of points. So let's start with the third set tiebreak. But just to say, I think both players should be really proud of their level uh, and of the show they put on. And obviously Alcaraz is not going to have any trouble seeing that. For Djokovic, he even admitted after the match that once he got over the disappointment of losing, there's probably going to be a lot of takeaways for him to take away. I mean, once again, we see him miles better uh, from a level standpoint here in Madrid than he showed a week ago in Belgrade and before that in Monte Carlo. I mean, he's improving very, very fast, and ultimately the goal is the French Open. Uh, however, in the third set tiebreak, the trend that we've generally seen with Novak Djokovic is it's crunch time, it's a tiebreak, he needs a point, He's going to be the guy who doesn't miss, who does not give away anything, and he's probably going to get a couple of mistakes from his opponent. If you look at the two mini breaks in the third set tie break that Djokovic surrendered, both of them were pretty unforced. They were pretty, you know, they were not good mistakes. They were first ball forehands, both of them, that Djokovic misfired on. And Alcaraz, his one you know mistake in the tiebreak was he hit one bad drop shot. So you'd have to say, and by the way, it went in the court. It's just Djokovic got up to it and was able to, to win the point. Um, Djokovic was the guy with the crucial errors in that third set tiebreak. And that is not to say that Alcaraz didn't come up with some spectacular tennis, that he wasn't aggressive and offensive. And that isn't to say that Djokovic didn't string together some, some wonderful points on his end in the tiebreak. But if you look at the two mini breaks, they came somewhat easily for Carlos, which is uncharacteristic. You got to point that out because the match comes down to a third set tiebreak. But ultimately, if you look at the big picture, there was a dynamic that Alcaraz could rely on over and over and over again, where Djokovic just couldn't solve this problem throughout the entire match. And I thought it was the number one key to Alcaraz ultimately being as much in the match as he was able to be, and then getting through at the end in, in, in the third set tiebreak, which is serving on the ad side, hitting kick serves on the ad side. Djokovic had no answer for that. And in this third set tiebreak, he won all three points, just, just to zoom in on, on the biggest moment and to make sure that that dynamic that I, I thought was happening throughout the second set and the third set was also a factor at the most important stage of the match, and it was. 2-1, serve plus backhand down the line winner. Djokovic hit a really hard return here as well. 4-3, uh, kick serve wide. Djokovic misses the backhand return. Free point. 6-5, match point. Um, kick serve wide, forehand inside in winner. So what do we get? We get a service winner and two third shot or plus one winners and that was a such a 
such a steady theme throughout the match and so essential for Alcaraz to win the match, I just felt like Djokovic never had an answer for Alcaraz's kick serve when he was serving on the ad side. And I want to get into that in a lot of detail and depth after a quick shout out to Player Court. It's the place to go if you're looking for a local coach, practice partner, or match. The number one reason people quit tennis is because they can't find anyone to play with. I don't want that to happen to you. So I've arranged a 50% discount for you to join the Player Court community at the link below, playercourt.com slash gilgross. The link is in the description. Okay. In the first set, Djokovic was certainly feeling the, the pressure of Alcaraz's kick serve on the ad side and actually made an adjustment. He moved back. He decided to drop back and put a lot of air under the return. And it worked. It got him to neutral in the rally, which is all Djokovic really wanted or needed on his return. He couldn't expect anything more. So he got to neutral. That's good. In the second set, Alcaraz countered Djokovic's adjustment and started serve and volleying. And it was effective, right? Djokovic having a a deep court, uh, a deep return position, obviously it's going to give Alcaraz more time to close the net. It's going to put Djokovic in a position where he's going to have to hit a very difficult backhand pass from way off the court. If he does make Alcaraz hit a volley, there's a lot of court for Alcaraz to volley into, the drop volley into the open court in particular, and that was a problem. So Djokovic didn't play around much longer with the deep return position. As soon as Alcaraz started serve and volleying, Djokovic goes, okay, you win. I'm going to move back up. And there was one time where he dropped back to try it again late in the second set. As soon as Alcaraz saw it, I'm talking the first time, serve and volley. Uh, the tactical awareness, the understanding by Carlitos to just be like, look, when you do this, I'm going to do this. No questions asked. That's the right tactic. Uh, that's really great presence of mind. So what was the problem with Djokovic standing in and to take that kick serve early on the rise? The problem was, and you can look at the match point where this happened, um, the problem was because because Djokovic was taking the ball early, he did not have enough time to recover his court position to the middle of the court. And he also didn't, you know, he was also on top of the baseline where it's difficult to defend. So essentially when Alcaraz hit, uh, made contact with his plus one ball, Djokovic was not recovered to the middle and he was not in good defensive position. So the court was open for Alcaraz's plus one attack. And it didn't matter if Djokovic returned to the backhand because Alcaraz's backhand is deadly enough and powerful enough that he can hit a plus one backhand with enough aggression to take advantage of Djokovic's compromised positioning. Obviously, if Djokovic went deep middle, Alcaraz did a, a very good job of kind of getting out of the way and hitting that first forehand aggressively. So over and over and over again, Djokovic was a sitting duck unless he made a perfect return. He had to hit it deep, he had to hit it hard, solid, and he had to make it so that Alcaraz was hitting a very uncomfortable first shot. If Alcaraz was not hitting a very uncomfortable first shot, Djokovic was toast because he wasn't in position, because he had to move in, and Alcaraz's kick serve was dragging him off the court, even though Djokovic was cutting off the angle as best he could. And by the way, I don't think Djokovic is as comfortable hitting that backhand return when the ball jumps above his shoulders. I just, technically speaking, I think he's he struggled um, against that serve in the past, and it's just not his best return. So that was the moneymaker for Alcaraz over and over and over again. Novak moves back, serve and volley. Novak stands in, plus one success because Djokovic is not in position. That was a huge key. Um, another big key for Alcaraz was, once again, the drop shot efficiency. Oh, I have one more point to make, I'm sorry, about the kick serve. Um, Alcaraz realized how much success he was having with the kick serve, scrapped every other serve. And what that did was it allowed him to make a super, super high percentage of first serves. And if you remember against, um, against Nadal, Alcaraz low first serve percentage, going for broke on the first serve, and I gave that strategy a thumbs up. 
against Djokovic, thumbs down. No need. The flat serve isn't going to really do as much, but the kick serve was effective. So let's hit that. So what happens? Um, the kick serve is Alcaraz's most repeatable and highest percentage serve. So in the first set, Alcaraz makes 55% uh, of first serves. And this is before he recognizes that he should hit the kicker. Uh, in the second set, he starts to see it. He makes 63% of first serves. In set three, his serve speed seven miles per hour lower. He goes exclusively kick. What happens? He makes 74% of first serves. So now he doesn't even need to hit second serves. He has a first serve that is working, that is effective, that is repeatable. And it is just really uh, a, a huge advantage for him. Okay, let's go to the, the drop shot now. Talk about Alcaraz's drop shot. It's so good. I thought Novak did a pretty good job of covering it. What was so amazing about this match is that even when Novak covered it, Carlos was so good at still coming out on top of the cat and mouse exchange. Uh, Alcaraz hit so many winners on his drop shot that it's easy to forget that even if you get there, you still have kind of another thing to contend with, with, which is winning the point. And if you look at the 5-6 game in the second set, when Alcaraz ultimately broke serve to win the second set 7-5, um, the first point was an Alcaraz drop shot that Djokovic got there for in time and missed the redrop. At love 15, Djokovic hit the drop shot. Alcaraz got there, hit the redrop successfully, he made it, and then he put away the volley. Then at 1540, double break point, uh, Djokovic had already saved one. Alcaraz hits the drop shot. Djokovic gets there and hits a brilliant cross-court angle redrop. If, if you want to call it a drop. It's a sharp cross-court angle, you know, scoop, but a very, very short angle. Alcaraz uses the speed. I don't think anybody would have gotten to this shot, but Alcaraz gets there, punches it down the line for a winner, places it perfectly. So it's the combination of the speed that he possesses and the hands, the touch that he possesses. Those two things together make him such a force in those cat and mouse exchanges, which by the way is something that usually Djokovic excels in and wins at against so many opponents. So we could see it here, huge game. Alcaraz wins the second set, wins three cat and mouse drop shot kind of exchanges in a row. And man, I mean, if he can always, if he can continue to do that, it's uh it's going to continue to serve him well. He won the vast majority of the points when he went to the drop shot. And again, Djokovic is someone who doesn't, you know, who, who minds his court position. We're not talking about a Medvedev or a Zverev um, who really, you know, players who really like to drop back and seed that court in front of them, which opens up the drop shot. And I thought that Djokovic, you know, was making it hard on Alcaraz to go to the drop shot, but it didn't matter because at the end of the day, it was about execution. And um, even if Djokovic had covered the drop shot, Alcaraz did a good job of still winning the points. Um, in the first set, Alcaraz did make some improvements from the first set. I thought the main things were more returns in play and more defense in play. It really did feel like in the first set, first of all, jo uh, Alcaraz just didn't make enough returns whatsoever. Uh, way too many free points for Djokovic. And whenever Djokovic was able to take charge in the rally and put Alcaraz under pressure in defensive positions, which was often because Djokovic was so aggressive off the ground in the first set, Carlos was missing a lot under pressure from those defensive positions, just not making balls. And uh, he started to get, he started to neutralize. He started to uh, make more balls on the run and out of the corners in the second and the third set. And then Djokovic unreturned first serves, 45% in the first set, 39% in the second set, 24% in the third set. You see that trend just goes further and further and further towards Alcaraz, which was uh, very, very crucial. Uh, those were his two main improvements, I think. Um, besides 
for the fact that, you know, we, we talked about that, that ad side adjustment where Alcaraz kind of readjusted and started serving volleying. That's what I have for Carlos. Now, I, I do want to talk about the success that Djokovic had here because he had plenty of it. And on multiple occasions, he was just a couple of points away from winning the match. First of all, Djokovic's depth, as expected, bothered Alcaraz a lot more than um, anything that Nadal was able to bring to the table in the quarterfinal. And I thought there were a lot of errors created off of Djokovic's depth, both on the return and off the ground. Not only that, but what we went to in the first set with Alcaraz making a lot of errors, just looking for, just being a little bit overly aggressive and uh, overzealous on balls that Djokovic is landing deep into the court that are not really attackable. And that's Alcaraz's main weakness probably is sometimes failing to recognize the unattackable and still looking to attack. Now, sometimes he makes it anyway because he's so talented. In the first set, Djokovic played perfectly from the baseline against Carlos because he was matching Alcaraz's pace to such an extent. He was actually superior in pace. The ground stroke speed on average was higher. That reversed as the match went on. He completely took Alcaraz out of his aggressive baseline rhythm, forcing him to defend, forcing him to trade and neutralize, not allowing him to really look, get, look at anything that he was able to attack. And Djokovic, as a result, was getting errors. And that's kind of how I feel like, look, it's really hard to do. But I think the best thing to do against Alcaraz is to try to put him under pressure and to stay back. You know, don't, don't come forward. Don't give him chances to really counterattack. Um, again, I, people might disagree with me on this. I'm not sure. But I think you just need to... You need to put him under pressure and make him defend, but don't give him any opportunities to counterattack because he will, um, and, and try to try to find those errors. I thought Djokovic did that. And also really good serve plus one play from Djokovic, especially in the clutch. If you look at the third set, uh, he dug out of so many service games. Um, obviously, he had the ace on match point at, I think it was 4-5, uh, but he dug out of so many service games with really, really strong serving, uh, really good plus one forehands, that had been missing from Novak's game throughout the entire clay court season, and it came alive here in Madrid. It's a little bit easier with the Madrid conditions to serve well and to, to play that first strike tennis, but my hunch is that we'll continue to see it operate at a high level for Novak Djokovic, and uh, he really did play uh, a strong match and had a lot of ingredients to win it. Uh, but he really, again, needs to figure out a way to win return points on the ad side against Alcaraz's kick serve next time they do battle. Um, and I think that'll be the number one key for him. So Carlos moves on to the final. Sensational performance. Let me end on this. There is no reason to suppress whatever people are feeling about Carlos Alcaraz right now. The hype, the excitement. Why shy away from it? The fact is, what he's doing is forcing people to have a reaction. It is, for the most part, a very positive reaction. People are excited. People are hyped up. Not only is that okay, that's a good thing. Forget suppressing the Carlos Alcaraz hype. Give me all the hype. It is deserved. And it's not something to try to ignore or pretend doesn't exist. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.